This video is brought to you by Masterworks. So stick around and hear more about the special offer they're providing to the entire upper echelon community. All right, today I'd like to do something a bit different. Lately, I've approached topics with a somewhat narrow focus. This company, that company, specifics here, details there. But this time, rather than focusing in on one individual person, entity, or isolated story, I'd like to discuss things from a somewhat broader perspective. To do this, we need a larger brush, obviously, metaphorically speaking. And we need to paint with bigger strokes, but hopefully the end result will be just as interesting as anything else on the channel. The topic is American finance, but rather than contemporary unrest, I'd like to use a bit of a historical lens and compare what is happening now to the 1933 bank holiday executed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. First things first, we need a foundation. What is happening today and why does it matter? For starters, of course, we can look at crypto, and what better example is there than FTX? As an aside, I will absolutely be doing another more detailed follow-up of FTX itself. In fact, I've done quite a few already, but it's a gift that keeps on giving and the story is always changing. Turns out that a friend of a friend actually is connected to, shall we say, an OG hacker collective, and I was given a bunch of personal information about Sam Bankman-Fried, Caroline Ellison, their parents, even BitBoy for that matter, including email addresses, passwords, physical addresses, you name it. Obviously, I'm not going to brutally dox them or anything like that, not even remotely similar, but basically there are some serious power players in the arena right now, and the whole thing is incredibly interesting. Anyway, that's a video for another time, one that I will, of course, be making, but speaking more broadly, the collapse of FTX has kicked off what seems to be cascade bankruptcy filings as crypto unwinds and deleverages in what can only be described as maximum chaos. This might be an oversimplification, I guess, but for the most part, crypto has experienced a series of what's called bank runs. Most people watching this probably have a decent understanding of what that is already, but just in case, massive crypto trading companies, exchanges, or lending platforms were using enormous portions of their reserves to effectively gamble. Bad trade decisions, mismanagement, accounting failure, you name it, it happened. Coupled with a massive downtrend in user confidence and a natural decrease in price as money flowed out of the industry, led to widespread redemptions, and the sheer scale of these redemptions, or withdrawals, eclipsed what the affected companies had for cash on hand. Natural results, insolvency, bankruptcy, and public failure, which decreases confidence in even more institutions, causing further redemptions and withdrawals, which means more bankruptcies. Basically a vicious feedback loop where decreasing confidence leads to bankruptcy, and bankruptcy further decreases confidence. Examples of this are everywhere. Every story has a slightly different flavor and set of causal factors, but ranging in scale from a few hundred million to tens of billions, crypto companies are falling like dominoes in a tightly packed chain. Terra Luna collapses, putting pressure on Three Arrows Capital. Three Arrows Capital collapses, adding strain to additional companies like Voyager and Celsius Network. Voyager and Celsius Network declare bankruptcy themselves. Then Voyager gets a credible bid on assets from FTX until FTX collapses, then BlockFi, then whatever company is next because the cycle isn't even finished yet. Regardless, the core premise is what matters here, where shattered confidence leads to mass redemptions, and mass redemptions destroy over-leveraged or improperly managed companies. However, in addition to that process, which many might describe as natural in the markets, bank runs can temporarily pull even legitimate companies underwater like a drowning man clawing to the surface, simply because client assets at that precise moment in time aren't fully available. I won't derail here into a larger discussion on what percentage of companies in America are responsible versus negligent, or even whether or not the business model is viable and should be used. It's basically impossible to make that kind of determination anyway from my position here. But the cornerstone of it all for today is that crypto is experiencing a series of bank runs, which reinforce themselves while tens of billions of dollars are discovered as missing. That's point number one. But this kind of psychological wrecking ball, if you will, is not isolated to just crypto right now. Time for today's video sponsor, which is, once again, Masterworks. I like to make a special note at the offset here for sponsors who have longer standing relationships with the channel and who provide income security, allowing me to keep doing this. So a special thank you to Masterworks for making that possible. Masterworks, in simplest terms possible, securitizes high value artwork from legendary artists. Banksy, Basquiat, Picasso, big names like that with multi-million dollar pieces. These paintings are physically stored inside a secure New York City gallery, and all of them are in compliance with SEC guidelines as a securitized investment. Right now we're facing a financial landscape of unprecedented volatility. Housing market turmoil, supply chain issues, Fed rate hikes, you name it, it's happening. The S&P 500, as an example, is down over 20%, I think, in 2022 alone, which is a loss of around $9 trillion. All of this and more has created a growing desire by many investors to diversify their portfolio, and that is precisely what Masterworks is designed to offer. 
The process is fairly straightforward. Masterworks has their team of analysts utilizing proprietary data compiled from millions of auction records around the world, sourcing art with the greatest potential appreciation. Once acquired, they divide paintings into shares, allowing for people to invest without needing millions of dollars each and complying with securities regulations, and then wait for the most opportune time to sell, dispersing profit to investors. One example of this would be a position that was closed in early October for 21.5% net return. As a result of high-level performance, Masterworks has had to acquire and release more art on the platform to meet increased demand, which has led to a waitlist. Having partnered with them directly, you can go to masterworks.art slash upper echelon and skip that waitlist right now. Again, there's a link down below to skip the waitlist and sign up for Masterworks today. Big thank you to them for sponsoring the channel. Point number two, Blackstone, not the same thing as Black Rock, some people get those confused, but Blackstone has recently halted redemptions as well with regards to its Real Estate Income Trust, R-E-I-T. This is because the volume of redemptions ended up breaching one of their safety limits, triggering a halt. They did not spontaneously decide to do this, it was a natural thing given their safety parameters. But this kind of natural increase, coinciding with a cascade of bank runs in the crypto industry, indicates that user confidence in larger financial institutions is, at the very least, shaky right now. In fact, the psychology behind bank runs has been exhaustively researched. Not just what causes them, but what kinds of people are most often participating, how they spread, Contagion, side effects, triggers, you name it, it has been studied. Because the danger of a panic-driven bank run is not new, it certainly isn't unique, but it's particularly damaging at a larger scale. To recap here, modern banking is a relatively fragile system. Everything works when confidence is high and redemptions remain low, or at least predictable. That's just a given. But any meaningful spike in user withdrawals can quite literally collapse the entire system if it's large enough. Like what's happening in crypto. That is, we see an active example right now. But the truth is, America has been through something like this before, on a massive scale, while managing to come out the other side mostly intact. I'm talking, of course, about the bank holiday of 1933, where the government streamlined a previously complicated state policy option and quite literally shut down the entire payment infrastructure, or banking system, of the country. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, here's what happened. In February of 1933, Michigan Governor William A. Comstock declared a statewide bank holiday for eight days, I believe, in an effort to preserve solvency, specifically for the Union Guardian Trust Company of Detroit. Union Guardian Trust, it turns out, was heavily backed and utilized by Henry Ford, one of its largest depositors, who had an ongoing feud with Undersecretary of the Treasury, Arthur Ballantyne. That feud, where the two simply could not agree, was over how to save Union Guardian Trust from impending bankruptcy, like many other banks in the country had previously declared between 1929 and 1933. But almost no one could have foreseen what would actually happen as a result of these individual efforts. Declaring a statewide bank holiday was intended to avert a potential panic-driven disaster, but instead, in conjunction with a series of other public and economic concerns, it ended up causing one. This lone singular decision out of Michigan, born from a simple desire to save a specific chain of banks, very nearly lit a match that could have destroyed America, as panic swept across the entire nation. At first, nearby states like Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois were affected, but refused to follow directly in Michigan's footsteps of actually shutting the institutions down. However, eventually, the panic had spread to every single state in the country, with institutions either temporarily shutting down or at the very least limiting customer withdrawals. The now very well-studied process, panic leads to redemptions, redemptions to closure, closure to further panic, to desperate redemptions, and ultimately more closure, had spun out of control to a point where the entire financial system in America was actively in danger, and only the most dramatic actions imaginable could save it. What were those actions? Simply put, a federal banking holiday for the entire country, with new policies behind it to ensure the public that staggering reopenings would bring stability. President Roosevelt addressed the nation with two distinctly different messages. To the financiers, he delivered a policy description where the government would be able to issue additional currency and ensure higher limits for customers on the banks that they chose to reopen. But for the general public, he simply offered an appeal of reason. Trust us was the core principle behind his message, because if the banks were to reopen and withdrawals resumed, unabated, the disaster would simply continue. Executed in stages, the first banks allowed to resume activity were deemed to be the strongest banks, despite the fact that relative strength here was kind of a mirage. These banks were now backed by the government to a greater technical degree. The public had been assured that these particular banks were solvent, fully, propped up by the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. And thankfully, the public was also deciding to respond favorably to these tactics as they rolled out. But the reality behind what had actually happened was kind of terrifying. Driven by a psychological stampede, banks had been blindsided effectively by a simple truth. 
customer fear was more powerful than fancy risk management techniques. It was more powerful than existing policies that they could control. And it was far more powerful than their entire business model. When that business model requires that they lend out money and hold less than what their customers deposit on any given day. The Emergency Banking Act of 1933 and the bank holiday itself largely restored confidence in the American financial system without actually changing core policies behind why it had failed in the first place. Sure, there were increased amounts of federal insurance. Sure, they had re-established customer confidence and made some degree of legislative changes. But the simple truth is that should the panic machine spiral out of control again, none of these policies would actually matter. For decades now, bank runs have been a fading concept in America, relatively speaking. Sure, there was a brush with them during the 2008 recession, a pretty close call actually, and yes, the policies established in 1933 probably largely helped avoid that kind of catastrophe. There have been individual examples of bank runs that occurred in the 1990s or the 2010s, but for the most part, the idea of cascade failure as a result of unchecked panic hasn't really been a problem since the Emergency Banking Act. The thing is, despite our growing lack of concern, the problem never actually disappeared. Right now, crypto is experiencing a series of bank runs that ripple across the entire industry. Massive real estate companies are halting redemptions as a natural upswing in public skepticism is born and people try to get their hands on their own money. And the result of that may die down or subside. There's a high probability, sure. But the reality of stampede bank run psychology makes this an incredibly interesting time to be alive. And by interesting, I mean kind of a little bit scary. Crypto is often hailed as the future of finance, yet crypto has been largely subdued by centralized players who are possibly even more susceptible to bank runs compared to traditional financial players. Our updated system of federal insurance certainly remains as a valuable way to hold confidence, but when enough simultaneous factors align, people will panic. When they do, they will seek to get what's theirs, and if that happens with a large degree of volume, institutions just inexorably fail. In the 1930s, America stood at the edge, staring into the abyss, and came back from it, because the single most important thing required for a system to succeed is that people believe in it. However, since that time, roughly 90 years ago, a lot has happened. Lockdowns, governmental overreach to an absolute extreme, political tension, the divide is greater than it ever has been in the past, global commerce disruption, COVID is a serious player in that arena with all sorts of supply lines and different issues, new forms of investment, talking about crypto, most speculative asset on the planet that are riskier than what we had before, and a host of other developments that have fundamentally changed how the public thinks and what they will do as a result. In the world of real estate, for example, the relationship between lumber and gold has actually dramatically changed. Relative to gold, lumber is pushing new lows, signaling that investors are taking on less risk at the moment, using an asset that is more economically stable, because they believe that current conditions require that effort. In fact, as demonstrated by Michael Gade, publisher of the Lead Lag Report, nearly every single major stock market collapse, recession or bear market included, was precipitated by weakness in lumber relative to gold. Simply put, this combined with many other factors out there, such as average credit card debt for typical Americans and many other things as well, indicates that the economy is on the edge of a historic cliff here, where all signs point to waning confidence, increased risk aversion, and some sort of economic turmoil in future months. Also sky high inflation, all sorts of different things, quantitative tightening. We're really in a precarious position here. Whether or not these new conditions lend themselves to spiraling psychological panic remains to be seen, right? We don't know what the American public is thinking right now in terms of whether or not they trust banking institutions, but I'd wager a guess that maybe they don't, or maybe that trust is lower than it historically has been, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago. But anyway, the conditions are there for market collapse, not just a market collapse, a massive one. And the fuse, in my opinion, again, I'm not a financial expert or an advisor or anything like that, but from everything I see around me as someone who considers themselves to be just a rational thinker, in my opinion, the fuse appears to be lit. Shutting down the banks as an emergency tactic already worked, and it worked quite well, actually. But should a similar event occur in modern times, the path forward would be very much different. Where that path might lead, I have no idea, but looking at the state of the modern world, I can't help but sit here and think that the same psychological factors that hurled America into a state of financial chaos before are growing once again, only larger, beneath the surface. In 1933, the governor of Michigan tried to save the bank used by Henry Ford, kind of a business darling of America at the time. And as a result, the country almost collapsed. In 2023, well, with crypto going up in flames, the housing market taking a nosedive, interest rates skyrocketing through the roof and inflation running out of control, all sorts of high impact decisions similar to this are getting made on a near daily basis. 
I guess we'll end up seeing soon enough whether or not one of them spirals out of control. That's it. If you want to support, please check out the links down below, Patreon and Locals, of course, the video sponsor, Masterworks, as well as a few other things. And I'm also thinking about having um, all of the videos worked up into shorts. So they'll take the same video, the same topic, the same script, and all the same information, and then I'll have someone condense it down into a short, so just the bullet points, and then have that on a separate channel. It'll be called Upper Echelon Shorts. Um, I'm thinking about that, and maybe it'll be on a different platform, actually, a whole bunch of things, but there's an announcement video with a competition coming and a new partner and some things I'm really excited for. So that, yeah, just stay tuned for that. And there's a bunch of links down below, like I said, etc., but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching. And have a nice night.